verses 9 through 14. 1 John chapter 4. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Father, we are delighted this evening that you have given to us, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior, that he took on flesh for us, that he might be the one that would pay fully for our sins, that he would be the one that would give to us his righteousness, that we might be perfect in your sight. We rejoice that we're your children through Christ. Father, help us to see him tonight. Help us to rejoice, not in anything else, but all that we can have. May it be said of us, all I have is Christ. Thank you for your spirit that lives and abides in us. In Christ's name. We find ourselves in the beginning of baseball season when our team, who went all the way to the World Series and looked as though they were going to win it after having won three games, the other team only having won one, we lost. But we had the hopes that this year would be better, and we still have that hope, right? We're Clevelanders. We hang on. Things can change just like the weather. But can you imagine the pressures upon you as a professional athlete to constantly perform, to constantly give what is expected and needed so that one is successful, one is right? We can know that actually in our lives, can we not? Not just those that are playing for a specific team like the Cleveland Indians, but we can know that kind of pressure even in our homes, in our jobs, where we seem that we cannot live up to the expectations around us. That's a nasty lifestyle if we really think about it. A, a lifestyle that says something like this, wow, I've been a pretty good person today. Everybody should be happy with me that stinks and rots of self-justification. It stinks and rots of self-deprecation when one doesn't live up to the expectations. Look at the people that you came with right there in your pew this evening. Can you look at one another and say, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm going to sin. Can you look at them, it's probably easier to say this, and you're a sinner too. I have a good answers for you in that. You are always going to sin against one another. But there is one who has been given to us to forgive us of our sins, and he is a great and glorified Savior. He is one that redeems us, and he is the one that we celebrate in this week of passion that we look to and say, I cannot, I will not be able to do this, but I must have something to satisfy the Father in heaven. We read in our text here in 1 John, we've seen it in the other text, whether we've read from Paul's letter to Colossians or we've read from what Isaiah said in the Old Testament or we read from John's gospel, we now see John, the beloved apostle, again saying to us, Listen, 
God's love has been made manifest amongst you. And you can know the love of God because he sent his only son into the world. I have two things tonight that I want us to come away from this evening seeing and recognizing about Jesus. Number one, God's love is knowable because Jesus Christ came into the world. God's love is knowable because Jesus Christ came into the world. I want you to see in verse number 9 that it says, in this the love of God was made manifest, or in other words, it was presented. Just as you might put something on a big jumbotron at the Cleveland Indians, as progressive field has it on the board, you would see it and you would say, now I see it, now I understand it. So Jesus has been broadcasting the love of God that we might know it. I want you to see two things about this love. Number one, it is a love so that, as it says in verse number nine, we might live through him. It is a love so that we might live through him. That's completely the opposite of our situation. Our situation apart from Christ is that we would die, but in him the love of God is known and we might live through him. Secondly, I want us to see in verse number 10, this love of God, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. I want you to see that he sent the son to die for us. God's love is noble through Jesus in this world so that, number one, we might live through him, and number two, that he would die for us. Verse 10 tells us that God's love has been made known to us because he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We've spoken of a team like the Indians. We don't even dare bring up the Browns, do we? Because we say, finally, almost together, there is no hope. There is no redemption. Can I tell you, you and I are much browner than the Browns with our sin. We are in such trouble. The, the problem that we have is that we need someone to come into our place to identify with us, to take our punishment, to take our place, and it seems like there's absolutely nothing that can be done for us until Jesus Christ comes and reveals the love of God for us. And it tells us here this important truth that he has been sent to be the propitiation, or as the NIV says, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, we look at this text and we, we see this important truth. God's love is knowable. And we live in a day and age when love is thought of it like this. Well, if God is love, then love is God. But that's not true, is it? Just think of a concept like grass. Well, grass is green, therefore green is grass. You go, no, that's absolutely not right. And here we begin to see God's love is contained in and it is spelled out, it is defined by Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is the one that can only satisfy the wrath of the Father, the justice of his Father for our sins. His love is noble because Jesus Christ came and died on our behalf. And what does that give to us? It gives you and me the forgiveness of sins. Let's say that you owed someone a million dollars and payment day came and there was no one to pay your debt 
and then someone stepped in and said, I will pay that debt. That's what Christ has done. But he's done more than just pay the debt. He's not just forgiven us so that we have a clean slate, but then he's given to us what we miss as well, the perfectness of life. See, you and I cannot maintain that perfectness, can we? You and I cannot quit sinning. You and I, as much as we try and make ourselves be good, the truth of the matter is, is we need someone to give his righteousness to us. We need someone to credit to us his wonderful perfectness, his obedience. And that's given to us in Jesus. Tonight as we celebrate Good Friday and as we think about Christ's death on our behalf, we can know the love of God because Jesus Christ has made it noble to us and that he gave his life for you and for me. And can I say to you and that you and I can know that we have been forgiven. I want you to see something else secondly. It goes between our first point of God's love is noble because Jesus came into the world. I want you to see verses 11 and 12 that connect us. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now, if you and I are truly in Jesus Christ, if we've come to the point that we recognize my sin must be paid for, and I cannot do anything to pay for it, but Jesus Christ has done everything, and I come to him in faith, what takes place is two things. Number one, you and I are born again into the family of God. Now think about it for a moment. Your first birth gave you the identification markers of your parents. You might have the same facial features or hair color or tone of voice, or same mannerisms. You might have things that, you know, the same big toe and other things like that. It's right in the DNA, and you can immediately look and say, yep, that's the child. You're the parents. When we're born again, the result is this. We're given life, and the DNA of the Father is given to us. It's not to be where you and I sit back and go, well, you know, now that I've, I've become a Christian, everything is just so easy and I just sit back. No, you've actually been given the same DNA and in addition to be given that DNA, it's just like what you have with your first family. There's expectations to say this is how we live. This is how we conduct ourselves. This is the manner that we treat one another same thing comes true with the Father in heaven. He's given us his image. He's given us the trademarks. And Jesus himself said as he was in the upper room with his disciples, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If the gospel truly has changed us, we need to see these two truths. Number one, We've been given new birth. We've been regenerated. And the life that we have is no longer ours, but Christ's living in us. And the result of that is, is that he is abiding in us. We know him and we're living through him. There's going to be a change. There's going to be a transformation. You know what is so unfortunate at times? that some of the accusations of the world about Christians really do stick. You are just a bunch of hypocrites. You're anti-homosexual. You're anti this. You don't believe in this. You hold to this. You hate people. You're phobics. All these other things. You know, and sometimes, unfortunately, we are not living the way that Christ would have us to live. It's unfortunate that there are times that people that are not Christians 
actually loved better than us. Do you know what I'm talking about? They bear the image of God in some flawed way as well. And sometimes they know how to love very well. They've learned it. But the truth of the matter is, is we as Christians, because we know the love of God, because we are the children of God, are changed and transformed. God's love is knowable. Because Jesus has come into the world and we know him and we abide in him. Secondly, would you listen with me in verse 13? God's love is knowable through his beloved, through his church, through his children. The way that the gospel is clearly demonstrated in the world around us is by the way that we abide in him and he in us. And the result is we have seen, we testify that he is the Savior of the world. He is a glorified Savior. He's a wonderful Savior. And so the result of this is this. We no longer have to live on this treadmill of life. We no longer have have to live trying to impress God. Jesus has paid everything for you and for me. I want you to know that when you find yourself in sin, Jesus has paid for it if you're his child. Stop sinning. When you find yourself not loving as you ought to love. Jesus has paid for that. So rejoice that you are forgiven. Come to the point of recognizing there is nothing that you can do to earn any form of forgiveness from him. Do you trust him? To your Savior. If He is, you have become His child, and we live because He abides in us. He is the Savior of the world. Father, thank you so much that Jesus Christ has completely forgiven us of our sins and that we are the children of God. My faith. Thank you, Jesus, that you have done everything to satisfy the Father, to pay for our sins, to atone for our sacrifices, to propitiate for us and our sins, that we might stand accepted and received and loved in your Father's presence. Help us to rejoice as your, as your children. And may the love that is in us because of Christ flow to the world around us. Thank you for this week that we can rejoice in a glorious Savior. Continue to change our behavior. Cause us to love as you have loved us. 